how many of you have heard of Lagrangian coherent structures? Okay. What do you know about them? Are they useful or what? Oh, know anything? Try. I know nothing. They're, you know nothing? <laughs> I think there are other things just called coherent structures. And so if you ask me about those, I'll, I, I won't know. But I know about Lagrangian coherent structures. It seemed to have started about 20 years ago. I'll give some history. First, I wanted to talk about things I won't be talking about that you might care about. I did some things with flying snake mechanics, but then, then looking at transport across the air-water interface, and then also some other mathematically related things about how you can get mixing in laminar flows, creating stirring. We analyze those by looking at braids in space-time of fixed points in, in a fluid, and I'm not going to be talking about any of that. So LCS is a way to understand fluid transport, in particular how particles move within a fluid. If you give me a fluid flow, I can analyze what are the main structures or lanes of transport or even Lagrangian vortices. And this is just showing a sample of some of the things I might talk about. What we're looking for, what is what is technically called a Lagrangian coherent structure, is the most influential material surface in a fluid in the sense that the pattern of particle deformation and concentration profiles seem to be dictated by this template of material surfaces. So in a 2D flow, we just have material lines. This is showing an idea of what we would call an attracting LCS, attracting the Grange coherent structure. So if you had a, a fluid part parcel that's straddling this, it'll spread out along it, so parcels get attracted. And then on the other hand, uh, we have repelling structures that seem to push things away. And they're actually just the time reverse of each other. There's different flavors of these LCS. These are called hyperbolic. There's also ones that are called elliptical that are more related to vortices. And they can intersect in interesting ways. So this is showing the stable and unstable manifold of a saddle type stagnation point in a flow. And the stable manifold is actually a repelling structure. It's stable in the sense that something along here will mathematically get to that point. But of course, everything else gets sort of stretched away. So a lot of this work grew out of the dynamical systems theory and dynamical systems community analyzing fluid structure. If we're looking in a three-dimensional fluid, then these structures, they always have one dimension less. We call that co-dimension one. Attracting LCS would be a surface that seems to attract things if you go forward in, in time. It's going to get squished along it. Repelling, same thing, but in 3D, things get stretched away. And they can also intersect in interesting ways. So here's an exaggerated aerial view showing Virginia and in the atmosphere and attracting and repelling LCS. And you could see if we had two, say, different chemicals on either side of one of these repelling surfaces, they will be repelled and go toward different sides of an attracting surface. And I show this because a lot of this work grew out of analyzing how plant pathogens and other chemicals move through the atmosphere. So a lot of the examples I have are atmospheric, even though it might not be the best place to look at first. So this is showing one of these surfaces that are actually moving. It's like a curtain-like surface moving over the landscape. And you can think of this as separating different air masses. These are boundaries between, in the atmospheric context, air masses. This is another example I like. This is showing ozone concentration over the South Pole. So you can see Antarctica here. The dark blue is depleted in ozone. So this is the time of year when there is a polar vortex. We hear a lot about the North Polar Vortex because it influences our weather. There's a Southern Polar Vortex. And the main feature that we're focusing on here is it's a vortex that separates air that's depleted in ozone from that which is rich in ozone. The reason you want ozone is to protect you from UV rays. If this goes over populated areas, then it can cause skin cancer. And in this particular year, this is 2002. This is from satellite. This is the first year during 50 years of observations that the ozone hole split into two, two roughly equal sized pieces. It always disintegrates, but it never disintegrates this way. This was very unusual. I did some work with a researcher, Francois Lekian, and we took some stratospheric atmospheric data from a meteorological model. We looked at the right altitude in the stratosphere and calculated these attracting and repelling material surfaces. So this is actually refreshing faster because the model has data every six hours rather than every 24 hours. But you see evidence of some kind of splitting going on. If we overlay the two, then you could really see it. This dynamical boundary corresponds pretty well with the boundary of this polar vortex. And this is an improvement over what meteorologists were doing before. They used something that's more like streamlines. And hopefully one of the things you'll get by the end of this talk is that what I'm showing is not the same as streamlines. Often people think, ah, it's just fancy streamlines. No, they're not. Right before the split occurs, I've taken one of these red curves. 
I tend to use red for repelling. I've got two different colors on either side, and you'll see that they do get repelled. In fact, these two colors or sets of parcels that are right next to each other will end up being in different lobes after that split occurs. So here's the split, and then they're in two different regions. So these you know, mathematically provide an interesting way to understand how transport is happening. And we're not even talking about all these little filaments. That could be important too. That was just in 2D. So looking on one surface the stratosphere. If you stitch several of these together, you can sort of get a quasi 3D. And this has been worked by a colleague, Matias Serra. So this is showing the 3D polar vortex boundary, not for the splitting event, but for a different year. And you'll notice this is the North American one. Here was a minor incursion into the US, probably brought some cold air and some lake effect snow. I'm going to go over some math, hopefully not too much to be scary. You will need to be familiar with differential geometry at the level of black holes and stuff. <laughs> That's a joke. Yeah, no, I'm not. I talk about flow maps. You get this from the velocity field. When you take a particle and then you integrate it forward, a fluid parcel, and you follow it forward under the velocity field. So just think of passive particles now. You're just moving passively. If you start with some set of particles at time zero, where do they end up at time t? That's what the flow map is. But it's important when we talk about this LCS. And this is all from George Haller, who's the father of Lagrangian coherent structures. He's at ETH Zurich. Think of a 3D flow. We're looking for two-dimensional surfaces. Some co-dimension one surfaces in a flow with the largest repulsion or attraction factor. So this is a candidate surface. We've got a point on this material surface. And if we look at the normal to the surface at that point, that's given by N. And E is one of the vectors that's tangent to the surface. If we follow this whole surface forward in time, we've got a new surface, we've got a new tangent to that surface. That's this blue N at time T. If we had just followed how this normal at the initial time flowed forward, we can compare those two and get what we call a repulsion factor. And the LCS, they solve a variational problem. We don't really have to get into the details, but they're finding the surfaces of the highest propulsion factor. So they're the most influential in terms of pushing things away if you go in forward time or <laughs> bringing things together in backward time. We tend not to actually calculate the variational problem. There's some diagnostic tests we can do. We, we calculate something that's pretty easy to calculate called the FTLE field. The finite time Lyapunov exponent. If you've taken any course in nonlinear dynamics and chaos, they talk about the often of exponents. It just it measures how two initially close points diverge away from each other. We do this for fluid particles. We calculate something that's related to this right Cauchy green tensor. So over here, I've got two initially close points, red and magenta. After a, a short time, they diverge. And they're actually on either side of one of these yellow ridges. What I'm showing here is color-coded finite time Lyapunov exponent. So the larger the Lyapunov exponent, the more things will separate. So two points that were in the blue region wouldn't separate much at all. You don't really have to worry about these mathematical details. These are things that can be calculated once you have a time resolved or velocity field. Another way to view this is if you look at infinitesimal circles or spheres in the fluid flow over short amounts of time, capital T, how do these infinitesimal spheres deform into ellipsoids? The length of the semi-major axis of the ellipsoid is related to this finite time we of exponent. To apply this to a really simple analytical flow, this is the steady double gyre flow where we could just have things circulating around. And we would expect there's a significant boundary here. There's the right eddy and the left eddy. And so if our method is worth anything, it should be able to find this boundary between the two, which we would expect. If you have two parcels on either side of this line, once they get down here to this stagnation point, they're, they're going to be pushed away from each other. So if we just calculate the finite time layoff of exponents, red means high values, blue means low. Indeed, we pick up a barrier. We're trying to get ridges of the FTLE field. Instead of thinking of these colors as a, a height function, we're trying to get a ridge of the height function. That becomes computationally one of the most difficult things to do, but it's more of a computer science problem or computer imaging. So that's for the steady double gyre. What about for the unsteady double gyre? You can just add a time periodic part to the flow that makes this boundary go back and forth. So these are snapshots of what the stream function looks like, and it's just going to keep repeating this forever and ever. But does this give the full picture about transport in this system? If you want to, you could think of this as a really crude model for the ocean, right? You've got just two gyres instead of 300 or so. And this is what we get 
it if we calculate the finite time layout from the exponent as a function of time. So you'll see there's this weird meandering thing that seems to be connected to the stagnation point on the bottom wall, and it's moving back and forth. So how can we interpret this? If we start with two parcels of fluid on either side, this green and the blue, this red curve that's meandering a lot is a boundary between two qualitatively different types of behavior, two qualitatively different regimes of the flow. This curve looks nothing like the closed streamlines. This is another cooked up example by Francois Lecky. We're showing streamlines, but then particles on uh, along the boundary here, they don't follow the streamlines at all. When you have a highly time dependent flow, you really shouldn't trust the streamlines at all. This is looking at the ocean. So this is the ocean height streamlines. And they depend on a reference frame. So this is in, say, one reference frame. If we have a reference frame that's moving with respect to the Earth, we'd see completely different streamlines. And yet the LCS don't depend on the reference frame. So they're called objective in that sense. It doesn't matter your reference frame. So that's part of the appeal. What I've shown here, these are saddle points in some sense from the LCS point of view in the ocean flow and how they deform over time. If we use just the streamline point of view, you could find some saddle type stagnation points just for the, looking for them in the stream function. But of course, and they're in yellow here, there's three in this reference frame, but in this reference frame, there's only one, which is right. Well, if you tried the LCS approach, you get the same things because it doesn't depend on reference. I wanted to show some examples of flu experiments that I wasn't involved in all of these. This was an experiment done in the Vlakos lab. We were trying to refine the method of getting these LCS CS from PIV. One approach was you get the velocity field and then you integrate it. And we thought, well, no, we can do particle tracking. Using particle tracking, we actually do better. What do we got here? We got a wall. This is like a laser sheet to it. And we've got these stable or repelling and attracting LCS. It might make more sense if I just put in an artificial green blob and you can see how it deforms. It quickly goes into some of these eddies, but it's highly time dependent. This was another experiment that was done at Caltech in John DeBerry's lab, looking at entrainment into a vortex. John DeBerry is interested in jellyfish, and he wanted to know something about how do jellyfish, as they swim, get food? Like, how do they bring water into the bell? And so they first started looking at making a vortex ring. So this is attracting and repelling LCS from an experiment, and then it's just coloring in black and green according to which side of the LCS they're on. And if we watch this in time, you see that you know, the green gets entrained and the black gets detrained. So here is a jellyfish and just a snapshot of the velocity field. And if you can make any sense of it, here's a snapshot of the streamlines. If you calculate uh, LCS for this, you can get what the jellyfish feeding zone is. So as the jellyfish is sort of moving along like this, it's feeding, but not uniformly uh, in a cylinder in its path, it's getting these certain lobes that get entrained. And so this is a pretty cool nifty movie that the green gets entrained and the blue just passes on by. So you can more accurately calculate exactly what portion of the cylinder ahead of the jellyfish's path will actually get entrained and potentially be food. This is a weird looking airfoil that uh, came from UCLA. And I think we'll see a velocity field. There's some kind of sucking and blowing going on here. And there is this line that you could see. This is the separation profile. And if we look at it, we've got white particles above the separation profile, black particles below, and you'll see what, what happens. So this is a way to get at these unsteady separation profiles. This one is kind of neat too. It's by a, a, another group at in Zurich. They were looking at revolving doors. So they had a you know, CFD of a revolving door You've got inside and outside. Um, I think this is just showing temperature, but eventually they'll show how long it'll take. Oh yeah, it's a long day. Yeah, there we go. There's some pretty elaborate LCS structures. So these are 2D and now they're just sort of taking a slice through it. So you can see pretty complex. These are some LCS over North America. You can see North America here, right? Baja, California, Virginia, Canada. So this is just looking at one particular height and you can see a lot of weather pattern stuff going on. I don't know if you saw at the beginning, there was actually a hurricane down here, affecting Florida. 
We can do some things with this. We can identify atoms of transport and mixing. And this was important for some work where we were looking at how plant diseases travel across the U.S. If you could identify these regions that are bounded by attracting and repelling curves, well, they have dynamics of their own. Attracting curves are attracted to each other, right here. And repelling curves are repelled from each other. So it means you've got everywhere in the flow, you've got, say, horizontal rectangles deforming into vertical rectangles. Angles and then mixing and folding. And that's sort of the engine of chaos. You stretch, fold, re inject, stretch, fold, re inject. Here's a typhoon that's hitting Japan. And then this is a snapshot of what the velocity field looks like. If you do a computation and find repelling and attracting structures, you can identify a vortex core and also identify air that's going to be detrained and then also entrained into the vortex. So how could this be useful? Well, if you know that the air that's going to be entrained is moist air, then it'll be feeding a typhoon or hurricane. If it's dry air, it won't. Here's another one. This is Hurricane Andrea, the first hurricane of the 2007 hurricane season. We've got a satellite image here, and you can see which way the clouds are spiraling. They seem to match the way that the attracting blue is attracting curves are are spiraling. If we look in more detail at this, this is Florida here. Very cartoony. You can get something like this. And this is a familiar structure to people who study chaotic dynamics. It's called a homoclinic tangle. Don't let that scare you. Well, it scares me. But you can identify a vortex region and then regions that are going to be detrained out or come back in. Probably the ones to focus on are this green and purple up here. They're right next to each other. But one of them is in what we call a lobe that's going to enter this vortex. And the other one is outside and will stay outside. This one down here, this magenta will actually move out. So if I color code regions and then animate it, you'll see what happens. So if you keep your eye on the green, the green was outside, but it goes inside. And if we can identify the vortex at a later snapshot, you'll see that the green was definitely inside. So this is a turnstile mechanism because once something comes in and something has to go out, it's a nonlinear dynamics phenomenon. It, usually it's been studied only in you know, time periodic systems, very controlled setting, but this is just the atmosphere. The atmosphere isn't time periodic. And yet we seem to have the same kind of mechanism going on. You can look at these things in 3D. So here is Hurricane Isabel. I think this is a little movie. This is made by Philip Dutois, who's at Numerica Corporation. And this is just looking at particles that were in different parts of the hurricane and what they do. Another recent use of these things, at least in the atmosphere, is to identify what we're calling air bridges. So this is Australia and New Zealand. The prevailing wind is always coming from Australia and going to New Zealand. We've got some contacts in New Zealand that are interested in knowing where are the main points of incursion of, say, some invasive species. One way to visualize it is when there's smoke coming from Australia. So there were some large bushfires in early 2020. So what we're seeing is the smoke from the fires, along with our computed path of the attracting LCS. So down here is the attracting, and then we're just sort of overlaying it up here. So we've got satellite imagery, and you'll see where the smoke tends to go, smoke and dust. It seems to be exactly along these structures that we compute. And you wouldn't get this by just looking at streamlines. If you look at the atmospheric streamlines, it just won't be there. To calculate these things, it can be kind of time consuming because you need to follow individual particles. It's completely parallelizable, but it'd be great if we can make it computationally a little bit cheaper. And one way to get it cheaper at the expense of some accuracy is you look at an instantaneous limit. What I've been showing before, these all have some kind of time related to them. Like this was probably looking at the attraction going back 72 hours, which means see this with say a thousand by thousand grid of particles, a million particles and then just follow where they go and calculate something based on that. That's how we numerically get the flow map and then things from the flow map. But we could look in the instantaneous limit and we still get some structure. I'll probably skip some of this. We look at this Eulerian rate of strain tensor and from that alone, we can calculate the eigenvalues of this S matrix and get what we're calling instantaneously off of exponents. And so that's a lot easier because it's just, it just is based on an instantaneous snapshot of the flow field does a pretty good job. This is a schematic over here. If we have a instantaneous Lyapunov exponent structure, this is an attracting structure. We've got a blob sort of near it. Then under the action of the flow, particles will tend to spread out along it. This is decreasing the integration time. This is Southwest US again. You'll see that as we go to a limit of zero time, there's still some structure. And here's the correlation between what we get in the instantaneous limit and if we were to integrate for longer times t. One of the questions that always comes up when I talk about these methods is, 
how do you choose this time t? And I often say it depends on the application. It's just a parameter. But if you can look at the instantaneous limit, then we've removed one of the parameters. So these are some instantaneous attracting and repelling structures. Blue ones are the attracting, the red are repelling. And you can just see what they do. They do what we expect, looking at 2D surfaces in a 3D flow. So this is an attracting, instantaneous attracting LCS. This is basically a double gyre flow where we trivial third direction. And this is a repelling LCS. The blob stretches out away from it. There's also applications to dispersion. If we included the effect of dispersion, so advection diffusion equation, in the limit of smallish diffusion, these LCS seem to give a good idea of where mixing is either likely to occur or not occur. This is a quasi-geostrophic flow that was found numerically. And if we look at a, a blob of fluid, so we'll start with a high concentration here, it's on top of one of these LCS, and then another one far away, we can look at what happens when we include concentration to those two blobs. Same flow, just starting at different places. This one spreads out very quickly. The other one just seems to linger. You still have very high concentration. I have a grad student, Albert Jarvis, who's looking at this and possible uses of it. There's also applications to the ocean, like oil spills and chemical spills and search and rescue. So this is the global ocean, and we've calculated the FTLE field, the whole global ocean, and even animated it. So here at the southern tip of Africa, you can see some motion going on. All of these things are moving. Basically, what, what we're picking up are these mesoscale eddies. I think they have a scale of about 100 kilometers. So I was part of a project where we were interested in measuring and predicting the spread of hazardous material, like an oil spill or some other kind of chemical spill, but also search and rescue. What's the application of search and rescue? If you have people or debris or a boat in, in the water, it mostly moves with the ocean. There's also some effect due to wind. The true motion is a combo of ocean and wind effects, even for oil, which is something I learned from this project. I thought oil just moved with the water, but wind is a big influence on uh, how oil moves. This is showing that tiger tail instability from the deep horizon oil spill in 2010. And there's been some work uh, by others showing that this followed some kind of LCS. And you could even predict it. I'm going to focus on search and rescue. The Coast Guard responds to 4,000 search and rescue events per year. It's just, just the U.S. Coast Guard with a 75% success rate. Success means you're found alive. So we'd like this number to be higher. I mean, 4,000 events per year, that's 10 per day. I was actually shocked when I heard that. The things that affect search and rescue operations is there's uncertainty about when and where victims enter the water. We've lost contact. We haven't heard from this ship in four hours. So you have the last known location and the response time needs to be quick if you want to save lives. So we're thinking of just a few hours here, not days, but hours. So models are used, like ocean models, that also include the effect of wind to find out kind of high probability based on if somebody was here, now according to the drifting so many hours later, where, where could they be? And that's what happens now is there's these probability maps and then you do a search pattern, maybe some kind of lawnmower pattern, and the assets are deployed like helicopters and others. And this isn't just a U.S. problem, it's a global problem. So in 2016, the U.N. Migration Agency recorded uh, 5,000 deaths among people trying to reach Europe by crossing the Mediterranean Sea. Our group came up with this transient attracting profiles for search and rescue. And the idea is from just one snapshot of the ocean velocity field. You could identify these regions where objects in the water will, will tend to collect over a short amount of time. So this is just showing schematically, you know, if there's if a ship is sinking, people will tend to be not just grouped in blobs, but along these linear features, traps. And if you could then do your search pattern that focuses on those traps, your success rate will probably go up. And this is just a little schematic showing that if they, you know, if the SOS was here, where we'll people end up, they'll end up in a region that sort of traps them. So this is where you would go. Another view of it, if we had, say, a grid of objects that were in the water at some initial time, some time later, if you calculate what's the nearest trap, the objects will probably be clumping near that trap. And then if you wait even later, now they've moved even further along that, that trap. It'll be one feature they tend to go to. So some work with uh, Woods Hole and MIT, in Berkeley, we experimentally tried this at Martha's Vineyard. I never actually stepped foot on Martha's Vineyard, 
but we, uh, I think Woods holds up. There are some high frequency radar stations. Using two high frequency ra radar stations, you can determine what the ocean current is at different points in, in the water. So as you scan over the water surface, you could build up an image of the velocity field. We did some work in a region where we had good coverage of high frequency radar, and we focused our 2018 experiment over here based on some predicted structures. We also had a lot of assets moving around. We had several ships. We used drones. They also had have some underwater devices that are getting information about the waves. There's also a tower that's offshore that tells us some atmospheric information. They had a lot of interesting uh, stuff over there. If you haven't been on a research vessel, wow, you're missing out. It's a lot of fun. Well, it's a lot of fun for some people. Some people get sick. Fortunately, I took all the precautions I possibly could. Now, I didn't get sick. I had to release and catch drones from the surface of a ship in three-foot swells, which is not, not fun, but we did it. So we released drifters and then mannequins, full-size mannequins. I've got like six of these. They're kind of like two liter bottles all connected up. But when you fill this thing up, it's, it's 180 pounds and it's supposed to mimic a person in the water. The drifter is supposed to move with the top one meter of water. So this is supposed to, as this moves, that represents the ocean. This moves slightly differently because it does have the effect of moving around. Plus it's got the windage affecting the part that's sticking out. It's also hard to get them in the right way. Like some had just their legs sticking up. And so we would release these simultaneously <laughs> on a grid. And we actually picked this zone because from the high frequency radar, as well as a numerical ocean model developed by MIT collaborators, we had an idea of where the traps would be. So we wanted to release these pairs of mannequins and drifters next to these traps. The traps are based on just what the drifter will do. And the hope was, well, maybe the mannequin will do something similar. We'll see. So we released several of these combinations. After a short amount of time, you could see the pair released at A, they're both right next to a trap. The pair released at B into another trap. I don't know what C is doing, but it's doing its own thing. After an even longer time, and this experiment was only about five hours, we had almost every object was very close to a trap which would mean if this was a search and rescue scenario, if you just went back and forth near these traps, you're very likely to find people. This is a video showing some work out in the ocean and it's a rough day out in the ocean, but it's fun. So we released a bunch of these, that's Javier, if anybody knows Javier has graduated. Uh, that's me releasing a drone and I've got these things on so I don't hurt my hands if the blades cut me. Got some drones floating around. And that's me catching in swells. That was crazy. So the hope is that this work could improve search and rescue. The evidence was pretty good. We quantified you know, how close were things to the traps that got published in Nature Communications. So I'll say a little bit about reduced order modeling. Tryon Iliescu is a mathematician who works on reduced order modeling. And he and I got to talking about, hey, maybe LCS could help improve it. One of the typical ways that you do reduced order modeling is you decompose the velocity field into time varying coefficients and then fixed spatial modes. And then you could calculate how do those spatial modes change in time. The typical ROM uses a Galerkin POD and it's based on Eulerian criteria. So streamlines, kinetic energy. We thought, well, what if modes were determined using some of the Grangian criteria? Could this lead to any improvement? Could we say for the same level of accuracy, get away with fewer modes? So we just tried something. We first looked at a simple ocean model, this quasi-geostrophic equation with wind forcing. It's kind of like that double gyre I showed earlier but now rotated and it's not analytically determined. You have to use some other methods, but this is the forcing profile. And this shows the vorticity as a function of uh, time moving around all crazy. And it is, it's hard to see, but if you take a long-term time average, this actually becomes four gyres. And that's what's special about this work. This is, it's using parameters from a, a 2000 paper. This is the finite time Lyapunov of exponent. Um, and so you'll see, you know, different regions are hot. Yeah, we've got red in different regions. Can we combine these two? Here was our goal. For a given 
low dimension R, find the best R dimensional basis of modes. And we compared the typical POD with one that incorporates this Lagrangian information. So we had to come up with a, an FTLE weighted inner product. Uh, so instead of just vorticity, we've got this parameter alpha. It's a Lagrangian weighting factor that includes the, the sigmas that represents the F FTLE field. So alpha equals zero gives the usual Eulerian ROM. Alpha greater than zero gives what we're calling like Eulerian or Lagrangian ROM. The basis functions look different. This is the 30th basis function. This is the just using Eulerian criteria. And this is when we have, we've tuned up alpha really high here, but you can see it's a, you get a different set of basis functions. Like I said, for this flow, the long-term time average of direct numerical simulation is four gyres, which is kind of weird given that the forcing should only produce two, but you get four. And if we use only 30 modes, this is the time average for Eulerian ROM. If we use the Eulerian Lagrangian ROM with alpha equal to one, it's not too different. If we really crank up the effect of the Lagrangian information, we're getting something that's close to the DNS simulation. So this tells us this is a fruitful direction to go for future work. I think it's interesting that including Lagrangian information improves Eulerian performance. Trying to get the flow field right is an Eulerian thing. So why is Lagrangian information useful. So that's basically it. Hopefully you've learned something about what Lagrangian current structures are. They're surfaces in 3D, material surfaces, or just curves in 2D that reveal the core of particle deformation patterns in general fluids. I've done a lot of work in atmosphere and ocean, but I think there's plenty to be done with experimental fluid flows as well. The instantaneous time limit also reveals some interesting patterns. At least the work that I'm doing, we're still looking at spread in environmental flow, so that's ongoing. And there's a lot of applications at the large scale, but possibly at the smaller scale as well. So that's it. Thanks. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. Check out my other videos. I also have lots of links in the description to papers and other materials.